My name is Crystal Orozco, and today I will be discussing Sykes and Mata's neutralization theory. The founders of the neutralization theory were Gresham Sykes, an American sociologist and criminologist who focused on the studies of delinquency and prisons, and David Mata, who was also an American criminologist who focused on juvenile delinquency. He was also Gresham Sykes' former student. In 1957, Sykes and Matza collaborated on their first article, Techniques of Neutralization, a Theory of Delinquency, which proposed the drift theory, also known as neutralization theory. What is the neutralization theory? Neutralization theory argues that delinquents know what types of behavior are deemed as wrongful, and because bad behavior causes feelings of guilt and shame, Delinquents are able to neutralize those feelings by justifying their behavior, thus allowing their image to stay reputable. This theory is devoted to explaining the reasoning behind the people who seem to drift in and out of crime rather than being consistent criminals. Neutralization theory has five techniques, also known as neutralizations, that allow us to understand how delinquents justify the wrongdoings. The five neutralizations are denial of responsibility, denial of injury, denial of victim, condemnation of the condemners, and appeal to higher loyalties. Denial of responsibility shifts the blame for a deviant act away from the offender. Oh man, this guy is following me. Why can't he leave me alone? What the hell did I do to him? I know she didn't ask me to follow her, but I can't help it. She's smoking hot. With a bot like that, I'd be a fool to let this chance slip by. I need to follow her. I just have to. The example here is that the offender claims that they were not at fault of committing the crime because there, there were certain circumstances at play and therefore had no other choice but to commit the crime. Denial of injury. An offender's claim that no real crime happened because nobody was harmed. What did you do, John? You ruined my bike. My dad got me that bike for my birthday. Why did you take it from me without permission? Why are you even crying, Jenny? You said you didn't like the bike because it was ugly. So if you really think about it, I did you a favor by getting rid of it for you, right? Now you don't have to complain about it and your dad could just get you a new one, one that you actually like. The example here is an offense where the offender sees no real damage was done and instead views the situation as having an easy fix. Denial of victim. The offender implies that the victim deserved to have the crime committed against them, committed. Why did you do it, Mary? My eye is swollen, it really hurts. You're so annoying, Dom. That's what you get for always making me so mad. The example here, there's an altercation where the offender may feel annoyed, angry, even bothered, and their actions caused violence to get rid of that annoyance. They may say that the victim would not stop pestering them, and so the victim asked for the situation to unfold the way it did. Condemnation of the condemners. The offender's assertion that the condemner's behavior is just as bad. Alex, you are 14 years old. You are not supposed to be drinking or smoking. Where in the world did you even get any of this? Chill, mom. Dad does this all the time, and you don't complain about him. He's been doing this since he was my age, so what's the difference? The example here, the offender argues that it is not fair for them to be blamed for something that has an equal outcome as their offense. And so the offender attempts to share guilt with the condemner. Since the actions are similar, 
the offender feels as though they are being targeted and punished out of spite. Appeal to higher loyalties. This elevates the offender's moral integrity by claiming selfless motives. Excuse me, kid, what do you think you're doing? Defacing public property is illegal. My gang be running this game. So no matter what, I gotta keep posted to let the homies know who's really putting in work. The example here, the offender claims that their negative actions were justified for that of the greater good. Some critiques of the neutralization theory include that the neutralization theory does not explain the origins of the antisocial behavior that offenders seek to neutralize. In 1970, criminologist Michael Heinlang performed a study on rural and urban youths during which he found no support for the neutralization theory. The study was concluded by stating that juveniles who have committed a crime were more likely to accept their behavior and not neutralize it. According to criminologist Travis Hershey, delinquency arises as a result of a lack of conformity, hence denouncing neutralization theory as an irrelevant way of describing juvenile delinquency. Sociologist Jack Douglas states that because a deviant person must learn certain strategies of perception, it is near impossible to cover up feelings of guilt and or shame like the neutralization theory states. Also, neutralization theory never specifies how the neutralization technique process begins or why. Some implications of the neutralization theory. Several current theorists have looked into Sykes and Mata's theories of neutralization to help advance their own related studies. In 1970, Priest and McGrath conducted a study that looked into the neutralization theory's techniques to study juvenile marijuana smokers. In 1983, Mitchell and Doder conducted a study that looked at the uses of neutralization in regards to different types of delinquency. In 1984, Agnew used neutralization theory to further their advancements with a study on violent criminals. In 1987, James Coleman used the neutralization theory to further explain how those involved in white-collar crime justified their criminal acts utilizing techniques of neutralization. In 2000, Barbara Costello studied the effects of self-esteem and the use of neutralization techniques. She found that delinquents who were closer to their parents were unable to use any of the five neutralizations. However, delinquents who did not have any close bonds with any of their parents showed signs of neutralization. In 2005, Bulk and Topali dove further into Sykes and Mata's neutralization theory, proposing that their version of neutralization was narrow and only focused on a small amount of offenders. Bulk and Topali then took it upon himself to attempt to expand the theory, adding neutralizations such as the transgression of mercy and denial of seriousness. In conclusion, Sykes and Mott's neutralization theory has had a, its fair share of criticism. But along with those critics, supporters have also risen and continue to use Sykes and Mott's theory and techniques to further their studies. Sykes and Matza's neutralization theory is far from perfect, but holds up a good frame to help others continue to test and study it in order to further its advancements as well.